Thank you very much. I want to thank Sages and especially the uh, committee chairs, uh, John and Anna, for the invitation. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to get even less invasive and talk about some endoscopic uh, options, mainly dilation, uh, Botox, and, and POP. Uh, here are my disclosures, no relevant disclosure for this talk. And just a very short introduction, I think we've, uh, we've been a dead horse quite a bit, but gastroparesis is really a, a significant disease. It's the second most common sensory motor disorder of the GI tract, and, and I'm quite surprised. I've never seen so many surgeons in one auditorium interested about you know, treating gastroparesis in quite a bit. Um, but it does have a significant impact both for patients and for healthcare. I mean, if you look at some of the graphs in terms of uh, healthcare costs, it's, there's been a 10 times fold increase in the cost of taking care of these patients over the last 20 years. And for patients, there's a significant decrease in the expected, um, in, the, in the life expectancy for, for a lot of these patients diagnosed with gastroparesis. And there's also a high incidence of some coexistent medical conditions, some of them very severe like diabetes. And the treatment is in reality very complex. So we've been hearing about treating the pylorus, and I think this has been a topic that has had a lot of growth in terms of the interest for both research and clinical practice. And the truth is that there's something going on in the pylorus and some degree of pyloric dysfunction that we don't completely understand, but it does have a significant role in the etiology of gastroparesis and how we treat these patients. And there's been some studies looking at manometry, and there's a pattern of pylorospasm in which some of these patients have a higher amplitude and a higher time of contraction of the pylorus that doesn't really respond to the typical an antral contraction and relaxation uh, feedback mechanism. And looking at some dilations done in the pylorus, there's an effect on both antral and duodenal motility that, again, we don't completely understand. Some studies looking at histology have shown that there's a depletion of the interstitial cells of Cajal in both fibrosis and, and biopsies taken from pylorus in patients uh, with gastroparesis. So when we talk about pyloric interventions, uh, Amber talked a little bit about surgical pyloroplasty, and what I'm going to focus on today is really dilation and stenting, Botox injections, and some of the newer therapies like uh, POP or PERL or pyloromyotomy. So talking about dilation first, there's very limited data that supports the efficacy of using through the scope uh, therapeutic dilation balloons for treating um, gastroparesis successfully. There's a lot of case reports and small case series, but Durability is always a question. I think it's important to understand that the pylorus in these patients is anatomically normal. So unlike a patient with pyloric stenosis, this is a pylorus that's going to be very compliant to a balloon dilation. So the durability of these uh, interventions is really uh, very questionable. There's been some other series looking at using achalasia balloons, but again, not a lot of long-term follow-up and not a lot of uh, good um, data to support these interventions. Stenting, which in my mind is a little bit of a more prolonged dilation, has also been tried, um, and there's been some case series looking at this. One of the largest series comes out of the Hopkins, Hopkins groups. Uh, they did about 30 of these uh, patients, um, and they did find that about 11 of them had some significant improvement of their uh, half-emptying times on gastric emptying studies. So most of these patients, um, about five or six of them, had normal gastric emptying, but again, you know, these are, these are therapies that are going to be very limited by their duration. And they did report a 59% stent migration despite using different techniques for fixation, including endoscopic suturing and some advanced clipping like Ovesco clips. So I think with the data that's out there right now, we can say about stenting and dilation that they can provide some temporary relief. But again, the data is very limited, and I think the reported rate of stent migration is very concerning uh, for a lot of us that do stents for other indications to really recommend this as a primary therapy for gastroparesis. So switching gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about uh, Botox injection. And, you know, some of the data coming from Botox dates back to the uh, mid-1990s when they started using Botox for treating achalasia. And there's been a lot of, a lot of publications looking at the safety profile and we know it's a very safe intervention, but specifically for gastroparesis, the efficacy of this intervention has really not been proven. And there's a lot of conflicting data between large retrospective case series and a couple of randomized control trials that were published. Most of the techniques in involve a four-quadrant injection with uh, a dose ranging from 100 and 200 units, which is uh, pretty standard. This is one of the first uh, retrospective studies uh, looking at 63 patients from a single institution, 
and they reported a 43% success rate, uh, which was defined as just symptom improvement at, after at least four weeks. Now, about half of these patients really had symptom relief for three months or less. So again, going back to the durability of some of these interventions, it's very questionable of how, what the long-term efficacy of something like uh, Botox injection is gonna be. They did find in this study that both patients that were male and had vomiting as a predominant symptom were associated with a better response to Botox injection. Now, two randomized control studies, one uh, from uh, Professor Tax Group in Belgium and one from Dr. Friedenberg uh, in Temple uh, were published uh, pretty close together. And what they both did is that they randomized patients to either a saline injection or a Botox injection. And what they found is that there was really no statistical uh, significant difference between the groups at one month. And on Professor Tech's study, uh, which was a crossover study, the patients that had a second injection really did not have any improvement after going from saline to Botox. Um, the Temple Group did publish some improvement in gastric emptying study um, with Botox, but not with saline. But again, this doesn't always correspond with clinical improvement, so the clinical uh, you know, value of this data is very limited. So based on this, there's really no clear recommendation that favors the use of Botox uh, based on, on what we think is level one evidence. And the American College of Gastroenterology published some guidelines for managing gastroparesis back in 2013, and again, they recommend against using Botox as a primary therapy for treating patients with gastroparesis. So, Moving forward a little bit, um, talking about per oral pyloromyotomy, and this has also been referred about uh, as G poem, and I'm, I'm more in favor of, of the term per oral pyloromyotomy or POP because it really describes best uh, what the what the procedure really does. And it was initially described in a porcine model in 2012 uh, by the ERCAT group in France, and the first human series came out of Dr. Swanstrom's group uh, in Oregon, where they did seven cases. And they found that they had a significant clinical improvement in the vast majority of these patients that underwent intervention. And when they tested five of these patients with a gastric emptying study, four out of five had a normal gastric emptying study uh, after the procedure. We published our data and we presented it uh, last year at a Houston meeting. Um, and I don't wanna sound very redundant, but we've been doing it at our institution since 2016. And to this date, we've done over 200 cases. Um, I can't get much into detail about the, the results because we're presenting this data at American Surgical next week. Uh, but we do maintain a prospective database under an IRB uh, protocol. All of these patients have a multidisciplinary evaluation. Um, we use gastric, uh, gastroparesis cardinal symptom index and gastric emptying studies routinely. Some patients do have a smart pill. This is mostly based on insurance coverage, which is very challenging to find. The instrumentation for, for our technique is just using a standard front view and endoscope with a soft beveled uh, silicone cap. We use a 22 gauge injection needle, uh, an endoscopic electrosurgical knife, and endoscopic clips for closing the myotomy. We published our technique, which is a little bit different from the vast majority of case series that have been published because we favor the lesser curvature approach. Um, we think it's technically much easier and quicker to perform than the greater curvature approach. Um, and I'm just gonna show a very quick clip um, with what we do. So we go anywhere between uh, three and four centimeters uh, proximal to the pylorus along the lesser curvature of the stomach. We use a methylene blue solution and, and create a, a, a nice bleb. Um, electrosurgical knife to make a transverse mucosotomy, which is different from a lot of the, the, the poem techniques, which uses a longitudinal myotomy. And again, the bevel of the cap really helps create this flap and get into that tunnel. And we're gonna fast forward here a little bit and what you're gonna see is, you know, as soon as we identify the muscle, which doesn't stain as well with the methylene blue, it's gonna really give us that map and what we're looking for is this nice curve of the pylorus or I like to call it the calamari. And once we get into this point, there's really no need to proceed with further dissection into the duodenum because the mucosa becomes very perpendicular and there's a high risk of perforation when you do that. And once you identify the, the, the pylorus, what you, what you do is just very, very slow and, and methodical um, dissection of those uh, muscle fibers. 
And what we're really looking for is that, that it's a very slight change in, in the architecture of the fibers where the pylorus is completely disrupted and it's almost like looking at the sky where you can see that very light um, blue hue after the pylorus is completely divided. You're gonna see that here in, in just a second. So you can see it here as, as the fibers are completely uh, divided. And you know, once once we um, once we complete the myotomy, um, we basically check for hemostasis, and we come back and typically close the the, the mucosotomy using anywhere between three and, and five clips. In the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. So, in terms of safety, uh, the the most common complication that we've encountered has been. GI bleeding from mucosal ulcers that happen either at the myotomy or anywhere uh, around the tunnel. Early in our series, we started using uh, both high dose PPI and carafate as a preventive measure. And all the GI bleeds that we've had since then have been in patients that have been non compliant with their medication. We've had one perforation in 200 cases um, and one mortality, which was from an unrelated cause. And at this point, about the last 75 cases or so have been outpatient uh, with, again, very, very low complications. In terms of uh, results, we have a very mixed patient population. The vast majority are idiopathics. We do see uh, a lot of diabetics and post-surgicals as, as well that have benefited from this intervention. We've seen a very significant improvement in the gastroparesis kernel symptom index, and not just as a global, but individually for each, um, each one of the um, uh, of the symptoms that are that are addressed by the GCSI have, have significantly improved. We've seen about 78% of patients with significant objective improvement in the four hour solid gastric emptying study. And close to 60% of these patients have normal gastric emptying study at three months after uh, per oral pylori myotomy. So we've, we're seeing a growing experience in literature. There's been a, an increasing number of publications both in the surgical and GI literature supporting POP as a treatment option for gastroparesis. I think at this point, we can start to think that the safety and efficacy has been demonstrated in small case series. Um, some of the early results are far superior than a lot of the other established endoscopic therapies like Botox injection or um, stenting. But again, we need level one uh, evidence and we need to work on getting some randomized controlled trials uh, running to really prove the, the efficacy of this intervention. So in conclusion, I think that the biggest uh, point is that multidisciplinary approach to these patients is key. Uh, we gotta work together with some of our medical colleagues and some of the other specialties to really bring the best quality of care for these patients. I think the efficacy of some of the established endoscopic therapies is very limited like I showed you, um, but POP is a very promising new intramural approach and uh, more data, especially randomized controlled trials and training is needed to expand the application as a first-line therapy for gastroparesis. Thank you very much.